All right, well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to a uh, event to release a new ITIF and Kauffman Foundation report uh, entitled the Global Innovation Policy Index. So we're really uh, pleased to do that and, and really want to thank our, our partners in this, the Kauffman Foundation, who uh, provide us support to, and be able to do this report. Uh, so we got a really fantastic panel this morning. Uh, there's also folks watching online. So uh, what we will try to do is, is uh, leave at least uh, 15 minutes for questions. So what I'll do is introduce our speakers. Uh, then I'll make a few remarks about the findings of the report. Uh, and then we'll hear from them and starting off with Ambassador Marima. So let me start with uh, the Ambassador. Uh, Demetrius Morantis is the Deputy USTR uh, uh, in the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, he's responsible for U.S. trade negotiations and enforcement in Asia and Africa, and he also leads USTR Global Initiatives on Trade, Development, Labor, and the Environment. Uh, prior to joining USTR, he uh, was the Chief International Trade Counsel for the majority on the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, he uh, also spent two years in Hanoi as the Chief Legal Advisor for the U.S.-Vietnam Trade Council. And between 98 and 2002, he served as Associate General Counsel at USTR and was instrumental in negotiating a number of free trade agreements, uh, including U.S.-Singapore uh, and U.S.-Chile. He's also worked five years for Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld, and he has a law degree from uh, Harvard Law School. Uh, next is Tom Khalil. Uh, Tom is the Deputy Director for Policy for the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, and he's a Senior Advisor for Science, Technology, and Innovation in the National Economic Council. Uh, previously, uh, before joining the Obama Administration, Tom was Special Assistant for the Chancellor of Science and Technology at UC Berkeley, uh, and then in the Clinton Administration, he was uh, Deputy Assistant uh, Director uh, for science, and, for technology and economic policy, and also the deputy director of the NEC. He's also been a trade specialist at Dewey Valentine, where he focused on uh, a lot of U.S.-Japan trade issues, including semiconductors. Uh, Tom has a, a BA in uh, political science and international economics from University of Wisconsin, Madison, and has uh, done graduate work at uh, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Uh, Eric Miller. Um, is the Senior Policy Advisor for Indus Industry Canada, which is their equivalent to our Department of Commerce. And uh, he's in D.C. where he's responsible for monitoring uh, U.S. economic issues, including digital economy issues. Uh, previously, he worked as the Washington Advisor for the Canadian government team that undertook negotiations for Canada's participation in the restructuring of the North American auto industry when that issue was uh, dealt with recently. Uh, he was also president of Miller's Rock Consulting, uh, which was a trade and government affairs firm. And unfortunately, he has a degree from a Canadian university, um, Carleton University, uh, and uh, where he has a master's degree, and he's a, he's a native of Nova Scotia. Uh, Steve Stewart is the, uh, is the uh, director of market access and trade for IBM, where he focuses on uh, his global responsibility for the management of public policy issues affecting IBM's operations globally. Uh, he also leads IBM's global market access policy strategy. Uh, he serves on the board of a number of different organizations, including UCEDO, which is the U.S. Information Technology Office, uh, which represents the U.S. IT industry in Beijing. He's also served as chair of the U.S. Department of Commerce Industry Trade Advisory Committee for ICT Services and Electronic Commerce, and a number, number of other posts. And uh, Steve has a master's degree in technology policy from MIT. Uh, and last is Phil Auerswald, who is a senior fellow in entrepreneurship, uh, focusing on expeditionary economics for the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. And uh, Phil is also a, a associate professor of public policy at George Mason University. Uh, he's also the author of a newly released book, The Coming Prosperity, How Entrepreneurs Are Transforming the Global Economy. <laughs> which you can buy that one copy today. <laughs> <laughs> and available at Amazon. And available on Amazon, Kindle. <coughs> bookstores in a couple of weeks. Pardon me? And bookstores, bookstores in a couple of weeks. Bookstores in a couple of weeks. Good. We'll look forward to reading it. Uh, and he's also co-author of a number of other books. And he, uh, Phil has a PhD from the uh, University of uh, well, Washington. So let me start by um, jumping in. You know, ITIF and a lot of other organizations uh, 
uh, the Economist, and a number of other organizations. They've all we've all done rankings of countries around the world on innovation performance. Uh, the view, which I think is absolutely correct, that innovation and competitiveness is critical to economic success in nations today, and so. We want to measure the kinds of outcomes and outputs that countries have. And so there have been a number of different studies that try to measure uh, these things. We, uh, we did a report a few years ago, for, uh, actually last year, called the Atlantic Century, uh, where we ranked 44 nations on their innovation outputs and in things <coughs> like corporate art, <coughs> the government art, the number of scientists and engineers, other people use things like patents. But to our knowledge, no one has ever looked at the actual policies what kinds of policies do countries have around the world, and who's got the best policies, if you will, to drive an innovation economy. And that's really what we tried to do today um, in this report. The second component I think that's important to, to, to recognize on this is that not all innovation policies are effective, not all innovation policies are, if you will, good. And my colleague Stephen Nizel, who's the co-author of this report, the lead author of this report, was also the lead author, author of another report we issued about a year and a half ago called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of Innovation Policy, where we essentially looked around the world at innovation policies in a broad uh, array of areas and said, which ones are good, good, if you will? Which ones are win-win? Which ones help the global economy and the national economy? So things like, for example, having a good R&D tax credit, or funding research universities, uh, or having a high-skill immigration. Those are good, good. The world wins with those. There's a whole set of other policies, uh, like intellectual property theft or standards manipulation, uh, that may help a country uh, but they're bad for the world. And so it's partly in that context that we're looking at this ranking, at these rankings today. Okay. Okay. Alexis, can you, can you fast? There we go. Okay. So what we did in this index is we looked at 55 countries and we ranked them on seven major innovation policy areas. Uh, open and non-discriminatory market access and FDI, science and R&D policy, <coughs> openness to domestic competition and new firm entry, effective intellectual property rights, ICT policies, open and transparent government procurement, and openness to high skill and growth. And in the report, there's a, uh, a fairly detailed description and citations of the academic literature on why these factors are you know, so important to driving innovation. So let me go through uh, some of these, and you can, it's a little hard to read that, sorry. Um, can we shut the front lights off, Stephen? That might help a little bit. So trade and foreign, and then the other thing I mentioned, what we did is we divided each of the scores up into, uh, into took the overall distance between all the scores, divided them into four equal quartiles, and then allocated them by country. And this is, a, for example, trade and foreign direct investment. You have tariff rates, non-tariff barriers, FTAs. Currency manipulation, FDI open. And you can see the upper tier countries there. Uh, I'm not going to go through it all. You can read in the report, but uh, Canada here, obviously, uh, the United States, uh, Singapore. Uh, and then if you go to the other side, you can see countries that really don't abide by this sort of openness to be able to bring in uh, the best technology. So you see China, Brazil, Argentina, Russia, countries like that. Uh, science and R&D policy, which is a lot of what when people think about innovation policy, that's really what they think about. Uh, but it's uh, here we're looking at R&D tax credits. We're looking at a whole set of indicators around how much money government spends for R&D, uh, also how much they're putting into university R&D, and how well they've supported uh, innovation cluster development. And a little bit more a broad-based uh, uh, distribution there. Again, countries in the top, Australia, Austria, the United States, Canada. Um, actually, the United States is not in that, sorry. We're in the, we're in the second train, partly because our R&D tax credit is not very good anymore. It's about 26 in the world. Um, and you can see countries that are far on the other side there, uh, uh, Mexico, Philippines, uh, and in between. Uh, domestic market competition and entrepreneurship. A lot of innovation comes from new entrants. It comes from companies developing a new idea and getting into the marketplace. And there are a lot of countries that have very significant barriers to new entrants 
uh, because incumbents have political power in these countries and they restrict new entrants. Uh, case in point is Argentina, where they restrict new entrants in a lot of different industries because of uh, political pressure. Uh, but you can see the countries, uh, these are issues, things like the ease of starting a business, uh, labor market mobility. And again, a much smaller group of countries there in the top, uh, Canada, the United States, uh, but Singapore, Switzerland, United Kingdom, Denmark, Australia. Intellectual property rights protection. This is a number of different uh, indices. Uh, one called the Park Index, which measures this. Uh, another was the software piracy. Another is the uh, USTR 301 watch list. And again, pretty broad distribution there, but you can see countries that are on the bottom there that really don't respect intellectual property and have a harder time building an IP-based economy because you can't, entrepreneurs just can't reap the rewards of that. Uh, you can see countries there like uh, Vietnam, uh, Mexico, uh, Indonesia, Argentina. <coughs> okay. uh, digital policies. Uh, a lot of countries focus their, their ICT policies, if you will, on getting the next Intel fab or getting the mi next Microsoft lab. And that's important, but the real benefits from the ICT uh, technology system come from their use, come from their adoption, come from firms using them, come from residents having broadband. So there's a wide variety of indicators there, tariffs, uh, membership in the in Information Technology Agreement, uh, which is a great trade agreement, which hopefully will get expanded around reducing uh, tariffs to zero on IT, government IT adoption, uh, telecom market competition. There's some indicators in there, for example, on do countries uh, tax and restrict VOIP, uh, VOIP uh, telecommunications. And a lot more countries there in the upper tier. Uh, as you can see, Iceland, uh, Finland, United States, uh, Canada, uh, and then a few countries like Mexico. Uh, now, if you know anything about the Mexican telecom market, you really shouldn't be surprised that uh, they're in the bottom tier there because uh, they have essentially a monopoly with incredible power. Uh, government procurement, um, this is a set of indicators about can you use government procurement to drive innovation but drive it in an open manner. Uh, this is a GPA membership, extent of state-owned enterprises, <coughs> of government corruption and uh, government procurement. And again, a lot more countries in the top here. Uh, uh, the UK, for example, I think is a real model to learn from. They've used government procurement in a very interesting way. Uh, and then some countries um, like China, for example, that you have used it in a, in a very discriminatory way through their indigenous innovation <coughs> product catalogs. Uh, and lastly, high skill immigration. Uh, these are looking at uh, how, well, how open countries are to high skill immigrants. Uh, and just really only a few countries there in the top. The uh, United States is not. Canada is. Uh, Canada, as you can see, Taipei, Hong Kong, Israel, and Singapore. Okay, so that gets us to the overall ranks. When you put all this together, <coughs> add up all the scores, who's, uh, who's, uh, who's where, and you can see the bottom tier countries, uh, they tend to be uh, less developed countries that perhaps don't have the, either the resources or the, uh, uh, the, expert, the, the experience in developing robust innovation policies, which suggests that there could be some role for helping these countries develop better and, and, and more sophisticated and more open and, un, and fair uh, innovation policies. Uh, lower mid-tier, you see countries that are here are trying to get up the ladder, China, uh, Brazil, um, South Africa, Turkey, but still haven't really figured out the secret sauce. Uh, upper mid-tier, uh, countries that uh, uh, you know are, are have done well. It's interesting, Israel's there. A lot of people talk about Israel being the model. Israel has some real strengths, uh, but they also have some, some weaknesses. And then in the upper tier, the countries that we think really do of the best job of getting it right. We didn't rank countries by actual score, partly to uh, you know not focus on, on small differences, but. I will tell you that our uh, our colleagues, to our, our neighbors to the north, Canada is one of the highest ranking countries in the, in the list, uh, which is why we invited Eric to come and talk about what they're doing. But you can see the upper tier countries there: uh, Canada, Taipei, uh, Singapore, the United States. So the last point I'll just say is, uh, what are the implications, and what does this matter? Uh, implications are, number one, policymakers need to understand that innovation is central to growth. And I think that's particularly true for countries that have reached a certain stage in development. What's interesting about these results is if you look at the correlation between per capita GDP growth in the last decade and scores, 
Uh, you get a pretty good correlation for all countries above $20,000 a year and per capita income. Uh, the correlation is about 0.2, so not super strong, but, but certainly pretty good. Uh, and you get essentially no correlation uh, for countries below 20000 So partly, I think it suggests that once you get to a certain level of income, a certain level of development, that innovation becomes much more important to driving your growth, uh, which suggests that countries need the beginning to get that right, not when they're at 20000 but certainly when they're before that. Um, the second is that innovation policy is more than just uh, support for science and R&D. That's a critical component of it, but it is a much broader innovation ecosystem, if you will. Uh, a lot of that today, a lot of innovation is about knowledge sharing, and knowledge sharing now is global. Uh, if you're not open to having the best uh, technology, the best minds come to your country, it's going to be harder for you to move up. Uh, I mentioned this before, ICT production is important, but what really is important is getting a system in place where you get all of your enterprises to be robust adopters of IT. Uh, having high tariffs on IT to, to somehow, uh, hopefully that you'll start, you develop some computer industry like uh, the Argentinians are doing where they're hoping to have Tierra del Fuego be the next, you know, the next computer production hub of the world uh, by putting really high tariffs on computer imports. That is just a strategy for, uh, for decline. Strong IPR, I mentioned that before. And lastly, you know, I think this is really the hardest problem a lot of countries have, which is, uh, including Europe, uh, in including some countries in Asia, where they, they want innovation, and they're really willing to do a lot for it, but they don't want any disruption. They, they don't want anybody to lose their job. They don't want existing companies to go out of business. And so they restrict this kind of, if you will, Schumpeterian creative destruction. And I think that's really one of the strengths that we have, that the Canadians have, a number of other countries have, is we're more open to that. We're more willing to let kind of groundbreaking, disruptive innovators come into the marketplace. So with that, I will stop and I will turn it over. Um, do you know what I'll turn it over to uh, Pastor Morantis for his thoughts and comments on today. <coughs> That was, that was great. Um, I have to apologize to everybody in, in advance. I am feeling a little bit under the weather today, so if I look and, and sound a little bit loopy, you can blame it on that instead of my, uh, my waning intelligence. But um, thank you, first of all, to Rob and to, and to ITIF. The work that you guys do is so incredibly helpful and supportive to what we do in the wonderful world of international trade. Um, there is a huge synergy between the reports that you issue and what we try to do with our trading partners abroad um, to ensure that they maintain a, you know, an open, non-discriminatory innovation policy. Um, and the help that you gave to us last year during our APEC host year um, in particular was just fantastic. So um, thank you very, very much. Everybody here knows how important innovation is. I don't need to go over you know, why it's important and, and, and you know, what the benefits of innovation are. But I want to just pick up where Rob left off, which is the importance of promoting innovation in an open, non-discriminatory environment. And trade policy really comes into the picture um, where we try to combat the trend um, of, of some of our government friends around the world who um, have not quite yet embraced open, non-discriminatory in innovation policies and have rather adopted you know, a more discriminatory government-run, government-driven um, innovation approach, which has not proved to be um, a successful way of innovating. We have worked really hard over the years to try to actually be supportive of you know, the goal of supporting innovation through our trade policy. Last year's um, APEC host year, it gave us a real opportunity to work with the 21 economies in, in APEC in really working hard, particularly with the government of Japan, um, in coming up with a set of principles that are geared towards effective, market-driven, non-discriminatory innovation policies, um, recognizing that an open trade and investment regime is the best way to promote innovation um, without distorting global markets. And for those of you like Rob, um, who were involved in the APEC process last year, you know that it wasn't necessarily the easiest thing in the world to get all 21 APEC economies really on board to a um, you know, a, a series of principles that promote open innovation. But at the end of the day, with a, a strong support from, from you all, 
from the business community, President Obama was able to was able to convince the leaders of the 21 APEC economies to issue this, I think, pretty profound statement of principles um, on, on innovation policy, which builds off a lot of the work um, that ITIF did and a lot of the principles that Rob just, just talked about. Um, so we were very excited about that because it does set sort of a nice frame for work that we're doing, not just in the Asia Pacific, but, but around the world. There's a lot of great stuff going on right now in, in trade policy in the area of innovation. Um, and I just wanted to talk about a couple of the initiatives that we're pursuing um, in the Obama administration and then um, stop and turn it over to you all for, for, for questions before I skedaddle. Um, one of the areas or one of the things that I personally am most excited about, which I think is really going to help um, promote um, you know, sort of trade-based innovation principles in the region is the work we're doing in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, for those of you who don't know what the TPP is, we're in the process of negotiating a, um, a free trade agreement with nine countries, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Chile, Peru, Malaysia, Brunei, um, and I'm missing Vietnam and the United States. Um, and we're negotiating, a, you know, a high standard 21st century trade agreement to deal with a lot of the competitive challenges that our exporters face in the region. And promoting innovation is one of the key principles um, that we're that we're using to guide a lot of our work. And there's a lot of interesting things that we're doing in in in, in this space. Um, you know, IP obviously is 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 one of the, the most important areas where we're negotiating, you know, what will be the most high standard um, IP chapter in any free trade agreement to be negotiated. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to strengthen IP protections throughout, you know, whether it deals with patents, copyrights, trademarks. We're focusing on, um, you know, the, the, the challenging issues of, of um, copyright um, in the digital age and how we can um, really take uh, protection, IP protection in that area very far. But it's not just in the area of IP that we're focusing on in TPP. One of the other areas that has been a real challenge for um, for our exporters, you know, in, in, in this space has been um, a free flow of data. And, um, you know, there have been, you all know this better than I, lots of restrictions that countries either put on with respect to the free flow of data or where or, or um, requiring kind of localization requirements for where you have to locate a server in order to be able to um, access information in that particular jurisdiction. You know, these types of restrictions are not good for innovation. They're not good for um, the internet. They're not, they, they promote the balkanization of the internet rather than the free flow of data. And so a lot of the work that we're trying to do, um, particularly in the e-commerce chapter of the TPP, is to enshrine um, these these principles um, so that data will flow, so that the internet will flourish, um, and so that you know innovation um, can continue to flourish as well. There's a lot more in the TPP that we're doing um, in that will hopefully promote innovation in the area of government procurement, um, competition policy, et cetera. And I'm happy to go into that in more detail. Um, another big um, initiative that that um, we worked on last year was was ACTA. Um, which, as you know, is a um, is a trade agreement um, that's designed to promote um, to to strengthen protections and enforcement of of of, of IP, uh, and it's really designed to strengthen, in particular, international cooperation against commercial scale IP theft, and w which, again, um, you know, as as Rob said, and as he was running through the, the principles, can also help um, support you know broad-based innovation policies in our partners. We concluded ACTA with a number of sort of like-minded trading partners, um, the EU, Australia, Canada, Japan, Korea, Morocco, New Zealand, and Singapore. Another area that we're working on, um, again, is, is something that Rob flagged um, in his opening, was how do we combat discriminatory innovation policies, um, and how do we promote the types of innovation policies, again, that will allow um, innovation to flourish. With the EU, um, we signed a series of non-binding trade-related principles um, on ICT services. We also signed a sim similar set of principles with Japan um, um, 
in January of this year. And th these principles address a whole range of issues, transparency in legislation and regulation, open access to networks and applications, the free flow of information across borders, foreign investment in, in the ICT sector, facilitating the cross-border supply of services. Again, many of the policy areas that Rob outlined as being critical to <coughs> developing strong innovation policies. We're trying to now take these ICT principles and, 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 and make them more global and work with other trading partners who are interested in, you know, in kind of stamping themselves as, as an innovation hub. I was in Mauritius last month, and Mauritius, as you know, those of you who work in, in, in Africa know, is really trying to establish itself as the ICT hub in Africa. They're really interested in, in um, these innovation principles and in signing on to them, again, as a stamp of, a, of, of kind of, of approval that this is a jurisdiction that actively promotes and supports innovation. I was in Manila last week and talked to the Philippines, who is really developing, trying to develop them. Um, an ICT sector as to whether or not this would be an area where the U.S. and the Philippines can also um, work on. But the biggest area where we are working on innovation principles and policies um, to combat dis discriminatory innovation policies is China. Um, the indigenous innovation issue that Rob pointed, pointed out has been a real, real problem in the area of government procurement, um, you know, just in the area of innovation generally. We, in 2010, agreed to a series of innovation principles um, and have worked through with, with um, Dr. Holdren um, in OSTP to, to develop an innovation dialogue with China, which I have to say has been extraordinarily helpful in focusing the attention of the Chinese on moving away from this model where you create lists of products and these are the lists of innovative products that are going to develop, uh, that are going to benefit from preferences. Um, as we've worked over the, the past two years with, with China to explain this is really not, the, if you really want to innovate, you know, creating a list of products that's going to be outdated the day the list of products comes out is really not the way to, 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 to go about fostering innovation. We still have huge challenges with China in this area, but the work um, that the Innovation Dialogue, um, led by Dr. Holdren, um, has been, I think, ex enormously supportive of the work that we've been doing at USTR and trying to get China to agree not to um, to continue this sort of pattern of discriminatory innovation policy. So I, it's been very successful. Um, we're still not there yet. We still have a long way to go with China, but I do think that um, we've put ourselves on a, on, a, on a pretty productive path. Another area that I just want to point to as well is um, some new things that, that we're working on. Um, you know, uh, um, Rob mentioned that, that one of the you know, key um, drivers of innovation, too, is lowering ICT tariffs, which is why you know, we're very supportive of expanding the information technology agreement. I know there's an event here next week that uh, my colleague, Ambassador Sapiro, who's responsible for the information technology agreement, um, will participate in. But this is another area that, that we can you know, work again with our partners around the world to reduce tariffs and to increase the, the, the flow of, of ICT products. Another area, and this is the last one that I'll touch on, is um, in the area of services, where we are now working on, on creating a, um, a services, for lack of a better term, a services <coughs> plurilateral, which is a, an agreement to um, increase um, market access um, for, it's kind of a free trade agreement um, in, the, in, in, in the services sector, which would obviously incorporate very strong provisions in the ICT sector um, and, and would also create a platform um, to kind of look at rules um, to address these next generation innovation issues that, that we face in the trade space. So let me stop there. I'm starting to drone on a little bit. Let me um, stop and, and uh, take any questions that you may have. Hi, um, I'm Jamie Brown from the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Um, curious about the WTO agreement on technical barriers uh, to trade and, and what you see as current trends there and whether or not you're finding you know, countries adopting the principles with that were established in that agreement or if they're still using standards as trade barriers. There's, yes. I mean, the, 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 the technical barriers to trade agreement has been very helpful for for a variety of reasons, one of which is it gives us the opportunity when standards come up 
that are discriminatory in some way to help shine a spot a, a multilateral spotlight on it. So it's not just the United States kind of walking in and way like wagging its finger, but but in the WTO you have sort of the broader membership focusing their attention on a particular standard that's problematic. But the whole area of, of the intersection of discriminatory standards, innovation, and IP is really, I think, the next generation of trade barriers that, that we're facing around the world. Um, China's indigenous innovation policies is just is an example of that. But you see a proliferation of this kind of approach um, in, in other economies too, whether it's a, you know requiring for s selling in a local market the adoption of, the, of a national standard that is in some way discriminatory towards towards um, open global standards. So this is a, 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 a real problem. The TBT agreement is, is helpful in addressing it, um, <coughs> but it's, it's, it's kind of one weapon that we have among others. So I'm Mark McCarthy with the SIIA. Um, I've got a question about the, the uh, uh, Indian um, uh, procurement uh, requirement that was passed in the last couple of weeks that would require 30% domestic content for electronic uh, products. A number of the trade associations have written a letter to the USTR saying that they're pretty concerned about this and, and asking uh, are there some steps that USTR is going to take to engage with the government of India on that issue. This is high on our agenda with India. There, there has been, um, unfortunately, over the past year, a, um, I don't want to use proliferation because that sounds dramatic, but a, an increase in the use of problematic local content requirements. Um, we see that in the solar sector as well. Um, and, you know, they're, 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 they're local content requirements can be extremely problematic for very obvious reasons and can also be violative of, of WTO obligations when they, um, you know, when they create kind of two tiers between imported products and, and, and local products. Um, this is an issue that, that um, we have and have raised with the Indians and, and continue to do so. But thanks for flagging it. Maybe just one more. Right back here, and then be the last one. Um, thank you. Uh, in the report, the, it recommends building ICT applications across many sectors, and it also recommends um, standards are cru crucial and to be open and transparent. But some countries, when they look at ICT, they see that as a necessary element, such as water or pharmaceutical. And so, how will we? How do you anticipate we'll deal with green technology? or other things where they say, this is a necessity, we want it royalty free, or we want to mandate it, and basically take the IP from those who invent it in the name of a necessity for their economy. I mean, it's a great question, and, and I think the answer is kind of two-pronged. There, there's the, as important as negotiating and enforcing rules to, to prohibit, um, you know, mandatory technology transfer, um, trade secret theft, or, or things that are really problematic. It's also as important and incumbent on us as a government and on, and on the private sector to really explain to governments why this isn't in their interest. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's one thing to say you're violating your WTO obligations or you're violating your TPP obligations. And you know, sometimes governments will respond to that, but it's much easier to convince them that this stuff is really a problem when you can really articulate why it is not in their interest of develop it, developing an innovative economy to go this approach. And, and, and again, I point to the innovation dialogue that we have with China, um, which has actually been, I think, rather successful in showing China that adopting closed uh, discriminatory standards or closed um, um, discriminatory innovation policies actually serves to undermine their goal of, of innovating. And the more that you can protect IP, the more that you can be open and non-discriminatory and actually face competition from imports, the, the, the stronger, you know, you'll get the sense of creative destruction that, that Rob was talking about that will actually lead to a more innovative society. We are not close to being there yet with some of our trading partners, but I do think the combination of the rules that we're negotiating as well as the, 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 the effort that we're putting into you know, really talking at a policy level and explaining why 
you know, in our view, there is an approach that takes that, that you can take that is encouraging of innovation and there is an approach that you can take that discourages innovation really helps. And things like documents and reports like the Global Innovation Index really help that because it it's it's an opportunity to to compile in one place, you know, the good um, that that countries that quite aren't in the higher tier yet can strive to. Ambassador, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, there's a lot of seats up front. Uh, there's a couple over here. There's a couple over here. So feel free to come on up. Uh, Tom, do you want to do it from there or from here? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll just sit. Um, well, I want to join uh, Ambassador Morantis in, in congratulating you for the important work that the ITIF does yeah, here you uh, uh, in, in terms of raising the level of debate on, uh, on issues related to innovation policy. And what I'm going to focus my remarks on this morning is to talk about four of the areas that were highlighted in the index and what the administration is doing in those areas. Um, first, in the area of uh, science and, and, and research and development, um, the administration has a proposal to make the, not only make the research and experimentation tax credit uh, permanent uh, because uh, Congress has uh, extended it 14 times and it's now lapsed, but also to simplify uh, and expand it. So that, that's one of the things that we're working on. In the area of civilian and research and development, even uh, in an environment in which uh, we've had to make deep cuts in other areas of d domestic discretionary spending, the President has proposed an increase in the civilian R&D of 5% in his FY13 budget. Uh, with uh, large increases in the physical sciences and engineering uh, and advanced manufacturing and clean energy. Uh, the administration has also identified some grand challenges, that is, ambitious goals that are going to require science, technology, and innovation to achieve. Uh, a good example is Secretary Chu's uh, Sunshot, which has uh, as its goal making solar as cheap as coal by the end of the decade. And we're also seeing companies beginning to embrace these grand challenges. So IBM worked on defeating uh, the World Jeopardy champion uh, with Watson. Uh, Google is working on a self-driving car. Uh, and I think it would be great if more institutions in our economy would identify a grand challenge that, that they would be involved in pursuing. Uh, second area I'll talk about, and that is domestic market competition, the report I think appropriately highlights the importance of new firm uh, entrance. <clears throat> and I think entrepreneurship uh, is part of America's uh, special sauce. And we have both a legislative agenda that the House will be acting on uh, later this week, um, uh, I, I think as early as today, on, on things like allowing crowdfunding, uh, dealing with uh, creating an IPO on-ramp to make it easier for firms to go public. Uh, there's a series of things that we're taking, uh, steps that we're taking that we can take in the absence of new legislation uh, under the banner of Startup America. Uh, and uh, Steve Case and the Kaufman Foundation have launched a private sector initiative uh, called the Startup America Partnership, where a group of over 50 firms have made commitments uh, totaling $1.2 billion dollars to help 100,000 high growth entrepreneurs over the next three years. So this is a good example of how there's a role for legislation, there's a role for actions that the administration can take through executive orders and executive branch activities, and there's a very important role for the private sector. The third area, uh, ICT, um, we've made a lot of progress in, in terms of uh, making more spectrum available for uh, wireless broadband services. Um, the Congress, uh, as part of the payroll tax increase, uh, passed legislation that will give the FCC incentive auction authority, which will uh, allow for uh, additional spectrum coming online. Uh, we've also been trying to identify government spectrum that we can make available, possibly using some of the new technologies for sharing that exist. Um, and we've been very active, to Rob's point, in, in not only looking at the infrastructure, but uh, applications of information and communications technologies, whether it's uh, public safety or 
open government, making government more open and transparent and efficient, encouraging third-party application developers to take data from government agencies and, and create new apps on that. Uh, health information technology, where we've made a major investment in encouraging the adoption of electronic medical records, uh, and also looking at uh, the opportunities in online learning, uh, where we believe that there are some really exciting opportunities for dramatically uh, improving teaching and learning. Fourth, in the area of high-skill immigration, uh, the president has proposed increasing the number of green cards for high-skill immigrants, uh, getting behind the startup visa proposal, allowing foreign students that get advanced STEM degrees uh, uh, from U.S. institutions to stay in the United States. Um, that has been a, a very contentious issue. So we're again, we're looking for th steps that we can take even in the absence of legislation. Um, and uh, USCIS announced uh, what's called the Entrepreneur in Residence Program, where they now have five entrepreneurs working with USCIS um, civil servants to identify ways in which existing visa categories can be allowed uh, to uh, allow foreign entrepreneurs to come to the United States and, and create jobs. So those are some of the things that we're doing uh, in, in four of the areas that you identified. Uh, Ambassador Morantis talked about some of the others in, in the trade area. Um, since I actually have two minutes left, uh, I, I wanted to make uh, two points uh, about future work in this area. One is that I think it would be really instructive uh, to look at the experience of the World Bank's doing business in. Um, they, they've been uh, creating uh, rankings uh, for countries. And I think one of the things is that you actually see uh, countries uh, looking at where they stay on the ranking, number one. And number two, since the World Bank is also collecting a lot of information and, and case studies about what constitutes uh, best practice or promising practice, and that's encouraging the adoption uh, so that uh, countries are, are learning from each other in a, in a very uh, constructive uh, race to the top. That's one point. The second point is that the economics literature forever has been trying to figure out what is correlated with differences in national economic growth rates. And that uh, economic literature is a mess uh, because, you know, if you torture the data and, you know, uh, do different uh, regression techniques, you can uh, make essentially whatever point you want to make. And the really interesting direction that some economists have gone on to is to, uh, to develop uh, growth diagnostics. That is for a particular country at a particular point in time with a particular historical background and political system. At any one uh, given point, what are really the binding constraints on economic growth. This is the work that Roderick, uh, <coughs> Professor Roderick at the Kennedy School has done. Uh, and I think that uh, there may be something that, that could be done that would be analogous to that uh, overall work on economic growth, where you identify for a particular country uh, what are the most important things that they should be doing in order to stimulate innovation. Because we've learned that a one-size-fits-all cookie-cutter approach uh, you know, doesn't begin to uh, be able to tell what you know Mauritius and, and Malta uh, should do because countries are different. So they should do the same thing because they both start with an M. Yes. Mm -hmm. Eric, Tommy. Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you, Rob, for your kind invitation. Um, first of all, uh, let me say that I think that reports like the Global In Innovation Index have extraordinary value. Countries like Canada do indeed uh, look at them, uh, and uh, we do indeed uh, take very seriously what they say. We're very pleased that we have ranked very well in the upper tier of all of the seven core areas of innovation, and this suggests that our government is getting some things right. But of course, by definition, uh, we need to view this as a snapshot and not as an end destination because things move on and, uh, and uh, we need to constantly stay at it. I guess I would say that every day that Canada and its businesses feel the pressure to innovate and our <coughs> Prime Minister Stephen Harper astutely observed at the World Economic Forum in January 
that the wealth of Western economies is no more inevitable than the poverty of emerging ones. And so let me take a few minutes today to tell you how our government is seeking to build a prosperous and innovative Canada, and I'll pick up on a couple of the areas in the report. So first, trade. Canada is a long-standing policy of free trade. Uh, we started with the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement in 1989, which grew to the NAFTA, and we've negotiated agreements around the world. We are currently negotiating an ambitious, comprehensive economic and trade agreement with the European Union and have expressed our great desire to participate in the Trans-Pacific Partnership <coughs> process. But it's not just big agreements that I think make a difference on trade. Um, in December of, of last year, Canada and the U.S. announced a new border agreement. Uh, $1.7 billion in goods and 400,000 travelers cross our shared border every day. And the border is really our economic lifeline. And so what we did was we set out to make the border work better. And at its core, this agreement seeks to strengthen the perimeter of the continent against threats so that we can expedite the movement of trade and travelers across our shared border. And we do this, on, uh, and we do this with an integrated cargo strategy, with pre-inspection and pre-clearance of goods in all modes. Uh, we integrate single windows so that businesses on both sides of the border can enter their information once and government does the backhaul. We've also agreed to some updates on business travelers and we're actually uh, going to need to push very hard to make sure that we get the greatest level of ambition possible. But one of the things we've already agreed to do is to put somebody's right to travel, to do business travel on their Nexus card. And so this is an important way that we are facilitating trade uh, across our borders. So with respect to the science and research indicator, Canada has a pretty simple view. Science powers commerce. Our operating assumption is that scientifically and technologically innovative countries become and remain prosperous. And I think this is exactly what the report finds. And so since 1997, we have been cre increasing our funding for science and technology at an average annual rate of 5.3%. And so we spent uh, in 2011 uh, $1.3 billion on science and technology activities. And we've got a pretty broad ecosystem, some of which would look pretty familiar uh, to U.S. eyes. Uh, we have an equivalent of the National Endowment of Humanities, National uh, Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and we also have a, a National Research Council, which, uh, as my colleague Jerome Pichella from the Embassy here uh, aptly describes, as a mix of NIST and DOE's Office of Science with a smidge of NSF. <laughs> And we have also put in place a wide variety of programs to support research at the university level at each stage. So we have the Vanier Canada Graduate Scholarships for doctoral students. We have the Banting Postdoctoral Fellowships for top-tier researchers to continue their work beyond dissertation. We've put $300 million into supporting 2,000 researchers at the assistant and associate professor levels at institutions across the country. And then we have the Canada Excellence Research Chairs, which provides major funding to world-class researchers and their teams to come to Canada. In fact, we were even honored to have uh, the presence of Dr. Stephen Hawking in Waterloo last summer. And so this is the type of approach we're taking. We want to build the best researchers in Canada, and we want to attract the best to come to Canada. All of this said, Canada faces significant innovation challenges. Private sector participation in research and development is still lagging. And in a report from our Science, Technology, and Innovation Council, it was found that low levels of private sector R&D are actually limiting our overall innovation performance. Put simply, when businesses do not invest in R&D, it's harder for them to stay competitive and grow. So our government created a, an independent expert panel to take a look at our policies and to see whether we are finding the appropriate balance. It was chaired by a gentleman named Tom Jenkins, who's one of the leading technology entrepreneurs in the country, and, the, and they reported back in October. And well, uh, our government has yet to issue, issue a formal response, our Minister of Science and Technology agreed with many of the findings. And so he said that our programs are spread too thinly across too many government departments and that our 
uh, research, our R&D tax credit was too complex and too unpredictable, and that we don't leverage procurement enough, and that we don't have an organization that is sufficiently focused on what we're uh, on, on, on what we need to be doing. And we, uh, we also need more financing at early and late stages. And so all of this has had an impact on private sector R&D. So while we've done well in the rankings, we have more work to do. And so we expect a response uh, from our ministers shortly, and we know that that response will be focused on helping Canada to continue to turn ideas and innovations into new marketable, competitive, and beneficial products. So on the issue of market structure, uh, we've done pretty well on many of the doing business type uh, rankings. But among the things that, that businesses need to grow is not just policy support, which of course is fundamentally important, but they also need financing and advice. And so we've taken a bit of a different approach on supporting that through our business development bank. Our business development bank has a private sector board, it pays private sector compensation, it charges for its services, it prices for risk, and it makes direct loans to firms. So what happened you know, during the Great Recession was that when there was a freeze up in credit and there was a panic, when good companies who, who otherwise uh, had been paying their, their loans back and doing very well uh, hit the wall, we, we were able to give forbearance to 25% of BDC's portfolio. So when market conditions returned to somewhat uh, normal conditions, uh, these firms were still there. And so firms that, that, that didn't need to go bankrupt didn't go bankrupt, and that helped us to keep the unemployment rolls down during the Great Recession. Just quickly on a couple of final points, um, we've got a very strong intellectual property regime, and we're working to make that better with a new copyright bill. For those that follow this, uh, the committee in our parliament, which is looking at this, will report out on the 29th of March, which will set up a vote in the House of Commons. And then finally, on the ICT front, we, like the United States, is fo have focused very strongly on broadband adoption. Uh, we've had a particular focus in the last six months on getting firm level adoption of ICT, uh, which has lagged behind the U.S. Uh, we are making more spectrum available to help us to keep from hitting the wall on spectrum. And uh, for those that follow the, the, the issue on uh, foreign investment, our ministers are, are considering whether we should have more participation on foreign investment. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Eric. Steve. <coughs> Thanks, Rob. Um, I want to start by thanking Rob, Stephen, and Luke for coming out with what I think is a great report. They've done a solid great service. Um, if you look through this, you know, in the seven core areas that Rob talked about, the 84 indicators, um, I know they spent many, many hours compiling this, so thanks for doing that. Uh, we don't have to do it ourselves. We just go to the report, and I think that's very helpful. When you look at these 84 indicators, um, it highlights uh, a very important point, that you really have to deal with a broad range of policies. And Rob and Stephen make this point in the report. Um, you have to look at an uh, innovation ecosystem. There's no simple path to this. So uh, a lot of countries look at, you know, how, how are we going to become innovative, and they think they do one or two little things. Well, that's not going to work. Uh, this shows that there are a lot of elements that influence uh, the ability to innovate. Um, a second key point that I took away from the report is that this is much more, innovation is much more about than about just technology or products. It, you can look at business processes, you can look at uh, marketing approaches, organizational structures. Um, there's innovation in a lot of ways that's not product or technology specific. And uh, countries that focus just on those products really come up short, I think, and, and miss out on opportunities to, to do much more. Um, and a lot of these process or business organizational issues are things that are driven by ICT. So um, it's, through smart application of information communica communication technology, you can improve your business, make it more competitive, create a business model that's not so easily replicated. Um, and that point was made very clearly in the report. If, if I take one thing out of this report, um, it's the simplest, is competition drives innovation. Um, when Rob was putting the charts up, if you noticed when he talked about domestic innovation, only eight countries out of the 55 made that first tier. That's got to be the simplest thing for a country to do, is to allow competition to take place and to encourage the uh, uh, creation of new companies and entrepreneurship. 
I think a lot of countries obviously are falling short if only eight out of the 55 are in that top tier. If, if you look at some of the indicators uh, that are in there, some of them are really quite striking. The two that jumped out at me from the World Bank, um, New Zealand, can create you can create a new business in typically a day. In the U.S., six days. In Brazil, 120 days to start up a new company. Um, that's clearly a handicap on the Brazilian economy. Or if you look at uh, the cost for uh, um, starting up a new business, in India it takes 56% of the per capita GDP to start up a new business typically. Um, in the U.S. it's 1.4%. A huge barrier uh, in these countries that are looking at trying to be innovative, trying to create new, um, uh, new companies, new products, new technologies, and they've got the basics really wrong because they're, they're not focusing on just opening up competition and making it easier to create a company. Um, Rob consistently has been making this point for a number of years, I've been talking to him, that um, the real benefit in innovation comes from raising productivity throughout an economy. It's not just opening up the next um, computer manufacturing plant or semiconductor fab. That's a very narrow slice of an economy. You get much bigger bang for your buck by looking at diffusing that technology throughout an economy, making sure that all sectors including sectors that are not exporting, so retail sector, for example, but that's very productive, very innovative, and, and that's how you can raise per capita GDP. Throughout the report and all of the work done here at ITIF, uh, the importance of ICT is often emphasized. We see, obviously, IBM, this is a little bit self-serving because I'd like to sell more hardware, software, and services from IBM, but it, we do really agree that it is a general purpose technology. Um, if we look at our customers, um, you know, we've got large customers, small customers through all sectors of the economy. They're looking to leverage what we do to um, be more competitive. You know, we have our marketing campaign of let's build a smarter planet. We think that you can take informa information technology and create new products and services and new ways of doing business uh, by leveraging that. The U.S. is typically one of the, the top countries in taking advantage of that new technology, and that's something I think continues to to need to be a focus here. Rob pointed out um, really that high ICT <coughs> tariffs are really just a, um, creating a, uh, a handicap for a given economy. It's, it's self-defeating to do that. If you, and, and that's kind of looking at the old, the, the hardware side, the old platform of IT. Uh, more and more ICT companies are looking at cloud computing as an emerging platform. That's an area that we want to make sure uh, does not create new barriers such as cross-border data flow restrictions. That could be a problem that uh, Ambassador Morantz has talked about addressing that through the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We think that's an, an important new initiative. Um, another thing I would highlight is the importance of innovation in services. 75% um, of OECD GDP, is, as the report makes note of, is in services. Yet a lot of countries focus exclusively on manufacturing. Um, and, and are missing huge opportunities to advance their economies. Now, I thought there was an interesting line in the report that says, services trade liberalization represents the next frontier in global trade integration and liberalization. That's very consistent with what Ambassador Marantis said, looking at trying to create a plurilateral agreement in services, focusing in Trans-Pacific Partnership on how best to um, advance services commitments, including, uh, again, uh, addressing cross-border data flow issues, which I see as, as an emerging trade barrier. Um, if, if I quibble a little bit with one of the indicators, um, there, uh, if you look at the trade and foreign uh, direct investment indicator, uh, there's a lot on tariffs and customs, and then there's the, the uh, services trade restrictiveness index. So that only got 5%. In, in future versions, I'd look at maybe expanding the weight you give to services. Um, uh, I think you might get a, a better picture, more consistent with really what you've identified as you know, this is a, a new area for liberalization, so I think we should highlight that. Uh, just a few other areas um, looking forward. If this becomes an iterative thing, I don't know if you're going to do this on an annual basis. You probably couldn't handle that unless you expand your staff a lot, I think. Um, but um, it, one thing that I, I noticed, there was no specific indicators on education skills policy other than the immigration piece, um, unless I missed it someplace. I'm curious when we're having the discussion to talk about why that's not there or what could be included there, uh, because it obviously gets a lot of attention. And, and we, we often note that the U.S. in, in K-12 education is not doing nearly as well as it should against global standards. Um, 
Rob mentioned the importance of knowledge sharing, and I couldn't agree more. We, we see a, a big trend in IBM, but in industry generally, of global collaborative innovation. And you know, some discriminatory domestic policies are trying to go the opposite direction in a number of countries. Um, I don't know if there's a good metric for that um, that we can look from a policy perspective. It's maybe uh, implied in some of the indicators you included, but maybe there's ways to uh, uh, highlight that a little bit more in the future. And, and I would also look at, as I mentioned, cross-border data flow issues as an emergency, emerging services barrier, especially when you think about cloud computing and the opportunities there. Um, you know, how can we capture that and, and looking at uh, what indicators could be created there. Uh, I'd like to think of maybe something like a doing business on the internet, a doing business in, in digital trade type of uh, uh, framework that could look at uh, a range of indicators in that, since I think it's a, it is a future barrier we're seeing. So I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, Steve. Phil. Okay, can we get there? Absolutely. All right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, five and five. That's kind of hard time. Um, so in my Kaufman Foundation capacity, I want to thank ITIF for a great report, reiterate what others have said uh, about the contributions that it's made. Um, and the rest of my, my remarks will be in my individual capacity. And in that capacity, I'm going to try uh, as hard as I can to disagree with everything that's been said and everything in the report, just for the fun of it. Um, so, I mean, I'd start out by saying uh, none of what's in this report is nearly as obvious as it may have come across in this panel discussion. I mean, we really don't know most of this, right? Uh, it's the best we can do right now. Um, so what do we know? What do we know about any of this? Well, what we, what we really know, we know one thing, which is that South Korea has outperformed North Korea. <laughs> I mean, we, that's pretty certain. And so we, we know that at some level, policy does matter. What governments do does matter. Okay, so people have been coming to the Kauffman Foundation for quite some time. I've just been there this year. I'm on leave from George Mason University, but I've been circulating around there for long enough to know that this happens. And so visiting delegations come to the Kauffman Foundation, sometimes very high-level delegations, and they want to know sort of what should we do. And much to their credit, um, the folks at the Kauffman Foundation, Bob Lighton, Lisa Mitchell, Carl Schramm, during his long tenure as president of the Kauffman Foundation, would say, oh, we don't know. We don't live in your country. <laughs> You know, and so you know there would be a discussion as what they know about what we know at Coffin Foundation about what happens in the United States and rich countries, but um, but uh, you know it's a difficult uh, difficult question. And countries differ in very substantial ways, and we haven't in among sort of economists done anything near I think a good enough job just to take the basic cuts right. So if you look at growth, if growth comes from the extraction of natural resources. Or if growth is sort of some sort of back channel of international transfers that have nothing to do with productivity, it's not real growth. You have to sort of parcel out what might actually have to do with productivity in the economy with the actual work of people in the economy and something that's just extract extractive or rent-seeking on a local or global stage. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, there's a fundamental difference between countries that grow as a function of capital deepening basically matching under, underutilized labor with capital, which is a growth strategy that's going to work for China, it's going to work for Bangladesh, it's going to work for Vietnam. It worked for uh, South Korea for many years. Now they're at another level. And so when you compare a country that grows through a capital deepening strategy with a country that has exhausted, with those many countries, we tend to call them rich countries, that have exhausted their capital deepening strategy and have to look to innovation, you're comparing two totally different things, right? And um, both types of countries are in this report. Um, this is not a critique of the report. It's a critique, almost a wholesale critique of how we talk about uh, growth and innovation, the relationship between the two. Um, now, you push it a little bit further. Um, I think that there's the most compelling story I can think of as to what works in development is that the places that are most likely to develop have experienced a few things. Let's think about, for example, China. China, uh, for about 150 years, didn't do much. Right after the Opium Wars, it was kind of a steady decline. China was 30% of the world economy. By 1979, they were 4%. Okay, today they're, what, 14-something? Okay, back on the way up. Not nearly 30%. Um, so for all those, uh, you know, many uh, decades over a century. China didn't do much. 
Uh, but in 1979, things started to pick up. Well, when did things really start to pick up? Things really started to pick up in China in 1976 when Mao Zedong died and there was an earthquake in Tangshan and the entire country went to hell. Right Now, this is a lot of people. Think about no government in the United States for three years. This is a big country. China's bigger. Okay, There was effectively no government, no functioning government. People throw that away, 1976 to 1979. That's when people did what people do when they're not being told what to do. They do the thing they're naturally inclined to do. So the, the family household system, where did that come from? It came from people trying to survive in an environment where there was nobody telling them what to do. And Deng Xiaoping came in and said, what can I, I can either send the PLA out and reassert the communes, or I can validate what people are already doing. So the first thing that works is anarchy. Okay, clearly works as a policy. Second thing that works is let's look at the most successful country in, in uh, Africa. South, 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 uh, South Africa does very well, but really the breakout success is Rwanda, right? Well, when we think of Rwanda right now, we think about a star of growth uh, driven by entrepreneurship. Wasn't what we were thinking about 15 years ago, right? Okay, so second thing that can work, internal strife, even genocide. Okay, I can go on down the list. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka has been a tremendous performer, uh, uh, has outperformed uh, Pakistan, where I've been doing some work recently, by orders of magnitude. They've been in the midst of a civil war for the last 20 years. So if you go country by country, Israel, you know, besieged by all of its neighbor, a breakout innovation success, right? South Korea, in a state of war for 50 years, and has grown more than any other country in the world. Okay, this is a real narrative, and it's actually, there is a point here. So we talk about the uh, doing business indicators, right? Tom brought that up. It is, kind of the, uh, it is kind of the point of reference, and I think doing business indicators has been a great contribution to the world. Is. However, what it has done is it is tended to convey a very, potentially corrosive idea. And the idea is that business friendly is the same as entrepreneur friendly. Well, I have one message in my few minutes here, which is business friendly is not the same as entrepreneur friendly. It matters a lot which businesses you are supporting. Are you supporting incumbent businesses? Which, and I'm not just talking about Pakistan here, I'm also talking about the United States of America may or may not have a very cozy relationship with the government through direct or indirect, elected, non-elected channels? Or are you talking about those businesses that could truly disrupt the economy, truly open new domains of opportunity, and truly extend opportunity into the society rather than concentrating it? Okay? So when you're in an innovative society and you're looking at innovation policies, it's delightful to see that the United States does well. But I can think of a few sectors of our economy which are arguably rather dramatically captured by incumbent interests and would benefit from entrepreneurial entry on a large scale. For example, energy, health, education, finance. These are all areas where I'm not blown away by the rate of innovation or by the rate of turnover in terms of core market power. So innovation to scale up incumbent power, innovation to scale up Existing institutions is not the same as innovation to scale out opportunity, innovation to scale out political power, and innovation to scale out what is truly great about market democracies. Widespread, broad-based opportunity. So, this is a great start. We should feel humbled by our almost total ignorance as to the validity of the policies and the suggestions in this report, we should soldier on. And for those of us proud few that are in those uh, high performing column, we should take a look in the mirror and really ask how well are we really doing and how well do we compare with countries that we regularly mock for being underperformers. Okay, that's about what I have to say. It wasn't anywhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Not a lot mild. So let me just make a couple of comments uh, in response to what uh, uh, some of the panelists said, and then we'll open it up. Um, 
I think Steve uh, talked about a couple of different indicators, and I think that's good advice uh, if we do this again. Uh, one of the big problems when you do this, or really any other report, is when you're looking at a lot of countries, it's really hard to get data. And uh, a lot of the, Phil, you mentioned a few of these different indicators. It really would be nice to get some of this. It's just hard to do unless you go and you'd have to do a survey of each country one at a time, which is, which is time consuming. Um, and then I think the main point um, that, uh, that both Tom and, and Phil said was uh, a little bit about what we don't know. And uh, I'm really glad you both said that because I, I think economists are, are, are among the most uh, sort of arrogant profession in, in, in the universe in terms of they over promise, they over uh, sell what is really knowledge and what is really much more about kind of doctrine and opinion and, and growth economics or growth accounting is, is certainly in that category. We, we don't know a lot and we rely on various studies and you can torture the data anywhere you want and I like the data that's tortured my way and I don't like the studies that are not tortured that way. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, this is where we are, and you've got to make uh, judgment calls. You've got to make decisions on, on, based on what you are. And the last point I'll make is um, I don't think it's quite as bad as, as Phil says. I, I think we do know some things more strongly than others. So I will assert very, very strongly that high tariffs on IT products is a really, really bad um, policy. So in, in, India came up before. There's a great Indian study by these Indian economists and they found that for every dollar of tariff on a computer or hardware coming into the Indian economy, it costs them a dollar thirty in GDP loss. But as they say, they make it up on volume. <laughs> Same thing on entrepreneurship and, and, and open competition, Phil. I think it's that's pretty non-debatable that you want to have markets where entry is easy. I don't think there's any debate about that. Uh, now there's other things, IP, there's a lot more debate about IP, a lot more debate about some of these other questions. Uh, but there is some things, I, there are some things that I think we know. Last point I, you alluded to really, which was uh, kind of disruption. And, you know, Mansur Olson has written about that extensively. Uh, uh, basically, that the, the secret sauce to growth is just having all of the barnacles destroyed and all of the vested interests destroyed through war or other major disruptions, and then you don't have these vested interests and you start over again and everything's on an equal playing field. And I think maybe that's a little bit about what you're getting at there. Hard to advocate that as a policy. Um, <laughs> Let's have a cultural revolution I, once every 40 years. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I agree. Let me just say, without the mic, I agree. <laughs> all right. So why don't we open it up if you, uh, if you want to, uh, first of all, identify yourself and you have a comment or question for any particular person. So uh, all the way in the back. Yeah. Mike. No, we're good here. These we're are just yelling. No, these, these pick yelling it up. Yourself. You're good. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, we're up there. Um, quick comment and then a question for our friend from Canada. I think Tom's point at the very end of his remarks was the most telling, where he says, it's not a cookie cutter. So if you're going to do another iteration, and I know this complicates it immensely, it's start looking at what's appropriate at each level of the of development and other other stages. because. As I was listening to the ambassador talking about the, especially the U.S.-China innovation dialogue, it sounded like the old Washington consensus of we're going to tell you how to do it as opposed to what I think they're really doing, which is a dialogue back and forth. And so the di just stress the dialogue. Um, quick question on the Jenkins report. Um, as I understand it, and you mentioned it very briefly, there was a section about the ability to use government procurement as a driver of innovation. When we think of open and transparent procurement laws, however, we tend to think about low cost, open to all, co all comers, not using government procurement for local innovation, which gets us into the indigenous technology. So what's different between what you're going to try to do with your government procurement and what China's trying to do with their ind indigenous technology uh, uh, proposals? So, first of all, um, I think there are huge differences uh, between the two. Let me give you a, a sense of uh, where we've gone in this particular direction. So, uh, in our uh, 2010 budget, uh, we developed a process whereby we said, if government departments are going to buy certain things as they are known to do, that we can in a sense provide support to small Canadian firms 
who are in that particular service area to make that first sale. So it's in order to give them some cash flow and to get them uh, to get them into the uh, the process of, uh, of of selling to the government. It gives them some credibility, and so that's a way of helping to use a purchase that's already going to happen uh, in a way that uh, that is supportive of the development of technologies and uh, small uh, entrepreneurship. Now, with respect to the Chinese um, indigenous innovation, that's a, a radically different area whereby you're mandating that companies hand over intellectual property and things of that nature. What we are simply trying to do is to look for innovative, non-market distorting ways to take a, a large pile of purchases from the government and use that to support uh, innovation development in the country. Uh, as I said, our minister has not yet uh, stated how specifically we intend to do this, but the intention is far, far different than anything you would see, say, with the indigenous innovation policy. Great, thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, Susan Hoyler from Qualcomm. This question is for the gentleman from IBM. Uh, it seems like we're a little bit in a space race when it comes to cloud computing. Um, NIST is leading the charge here in the U.S., Korea, Etri, Japan has an ac activity, EU has a Siena project. And if each country is doing its national policy addressing emerging technology, it seems like we're wasting resources or there's going to be a problem with collaboration. How, how do we work, step out of the box from just a national policy to think more global as all these countries? work to go for the next emerging trend, such as cloud computing. Now, are, are you talking about competing standards? Um, Even before standards, you go to research. If every government is putting money into their R&D policy or their innovation policy to promote cloud computing, and they're starting from scratch, if everybody's operating in a silo in their national policy, we're going to be repeating efforts, but then you get to the issue of standards. So it's at many levels that there would possibly be redundancy or wasted resources, and I just wonder if you have a comment, if you could either talk about it from an R&D perspective or a standards perspective. Well, first of all, if, if a lot of countries want to invest in R&D and cloud computing or anything else, that's great. The key thing then is that they're talking to one another, that they're not going to cross purposes, that they're, they're not trying to, you know, uh, set up a monopoly on some standard then exclude everybody else. Uh, I just don't think that works very well anymore. Um, and so if, if you focus on setting up you know, collaboration, public-private partnerships, uh, international fora where the, the technical people working on this get together, um, sharing ideas, you know, this, this is, I think basically you have to get away from a, uh, a, a zero-sum view of this, that you know, more R&D, more research, more collaboration is better for everybody. We can all benefit from that. So that would be my, my basic response. Questions for Mr. Khalil. Can you identify yourself? Sorry, Frank Spring from uh, Zentrum Consulting. The uh, President's fiscal year 2013 budget mentioned a national network for uh, manufacturing innovation. Can you offer some uh, some detail on that program? Stay tuned. <laughs> Can you tell us what day we should stay tuned for? <laughs> How long? <laughs> and and really, which network? <laughs> really anxious to know the date, but I, I'm, 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 we're really excited about it, Tom. It looks great in what we know, and we don't know anything, so we know little, but it looks great. It's great. Uh, you know, I, I will say that it, it's uh, going to uh, draw on the work of the PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, which did a report on advanced manufacturing and uh, some follow-up uh, work that has been uh, led by uh, Susan Hockfield, the President of MIT, and Andrew Liveris, uh, CEO of Dow Chemical. and. Uh, I think there's been some really exciting uh, convergence on the views of uh, leaders in uh, industry and, and academia and government on this. So uh, uh, I'm hopeful that the proposal will also get some bipartisan support. Here and then here. Jim Say. Uh, Rob, you mentioned in your talk that there was a 0.2 correlation between your metrics and the uh, greater than 20K economies and zero 
I am looking quickly through the report. I don't see the basis for that. Do you have that in here or no. is there somebody I can ask That's about not in there. Guys did that? It's not in there. We did it afterwards, uh, which we should have done it, but we didn't. Uh, I'm happy to share that spreadsheet with you if you'd like to take a look at it. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to go in order. Um, so back here and then here. Hi, uh, Derek Kill from National Science Foundation. Um, Simon Johnson and others have, have argued that um, the financial sector uh, in the U.S., perhaps Ireland, there was too much innovation going on and it was unregulated and that was a, a big cause of our economic uh, recession. So is there a way to, uh, is this relevant in terms of indicators of how to sort of separate out what is, quote, bad innovation and what's good innovation? You know, a country that looks good in all these indicators like the U.S., then it turns out there was probably real problems with this finance sector that, that Led to big pro other big problems. Uh, I, I want to take that question because. Uh, Is this, there, there we go. Well, now it's back off again. I'm going to wait. You going to do it for me? <laughs> <laughs> Master of the mic. Okay, doesn't yeah. matter. Um, so, um, I mean, clearly, he, on a panel where you know we many of us know each other uh and uh we've been working in the same space for a long time um i just first have to say obviously i was going out of my way to disagree as much as possible but fundamentally uh, i agree with with rob i do think we know some of these things more than others and i particularly agree with your point about entrepreneurship and competition and that's really you know in some sense if i was going to you know distill then to a specific comment about the report I'd, it's not even a question of weighting the variables it's a question of understanding their functional relationship and and, um, and it's it's the sort of, you know, why am I at the Coffin Foundation? And, you, you know, it's not just because I'm representing the Coffin Foundation that I'm saying it. I'm at the Coffin Foundation because I believe certain things. And one of the things that I believe is that, that, that what you're describing was not innovation because it had no element of actual disruption of incumbent power. It was just a reassertion and extension of incumbent power. And, in fact, it wasn't even risk-taking. It was a corruption of a market process. So it had absolutely nothing to do with innovation. It had zero, zero to do with entrepreneurship. It was just the inverse, right? It was writing checks from the U.S. Treasury to themselves. So clearly that's a bad thing. And we should learn that lesson. And we should look for other places in the economy where people may be writing checks to themselves from the U.S. Treasury through certain assumptions about risk and who will bear it and what a political process will entail and so forth and so on. So I'm in sort of rough agreement with some of what Simon Johnson has to say. I am in absolutely total disagreement with the characterization of that activity as innovation. And I think it's, it's a real distortion of the word. And it leads to a real miscomprehension of what the word is. Yeah, I just add to that that um, my colleague Stephen Azell and I, we have a book coming out in September uh, from Yale Press called Innovation Economics, The Race for Global Advantage. Anyway, we make an assertion in there, which you don't have to buy, but our assertion is that you look at the financial collapse in a country like the United States and Ireland, it was actually because there wasn't enough innovation. So our rates of innovation in the 2000s were much lower than they were in the 1990s. Things like IPOs, things like venture funding, things like new startups, things like productivity, things like corporate R&D. Uh, that was a lot lower. And it was because, in our assertion, it was because there weren't those real private market demands for capital. So you look at the demand for capital from enterprises in the U.S., whether they're small or big, uh, particularly in, in manufacturing and entrepreneurial innovative sectors. The demand for capital went down, uh, but the supply didn't. And so rather, most, this is, goes to Phil's point, most industries, when demand goes down, they either shrink or they innovate. And what Wall Street did was neither. They just manipulated. And they figured out a Ponzi scheme to make some money in the short run. Uh, but the fundamental problem was there wasn't real demand, uh, at least, again, our assertion. So <coughs> that's where I think the real challenge is. We, had, we didn't have enough innovation. We needed a lot more. Um, and, Time for maybe one more. Yeah. Yeah, uh, David Cheney with, with SRI. This sort of follow up on the question about the correlation between the uh, the index and the output measures. Have, have you tried either tweaking the weightings to see if you get a higher correlation, or alternatively, also, are you thinking about making the the database 
public so other people can, can play with and maybe yeah. test some of the ideas if you know Phil had about subtracting things out and looking for other correlations? Uh, we can torture the data a lot more. Uh, uh, just kidding. Uh, I think that's a great idea. I think we can make the data available. So if anybody's interested, just email me and uh, our at can send it to or we can. Uh, 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 I just might add to that point that we extensively, of course, notate and cite where all of the data comes from. And many of its public institutions, like the World Bank, give us this report. So we can do that. But also, it's extensively notated for this data. It's out there publicly that you can go and get it if you want separately. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, we didn't we didn't look at it for sub uh, category. So perhaps some of the subcategories have uh, have higher impacts or lower impacts or differential impacts. So we, we didn't we definitely didn't do that. Um, okay, did you set a hand? Yeah. Okay. Just just uh, uh, Brett Berlin, uh, uh, DRC, and, and also uh, George Mason. We talk a lot about over the years. Uh, we've talked a lot about government policy. Government policy is outward looking, outward facing in a certain way. The up, the other side of that is government action. Not government action about the policy, but government action within the government on how it does its mission. So one thing that you might want to look at in, in as we future is, is that issue. For example, uh, this goes way back. Uh, uh, Tom and I have uh, talked about a lot of that in the past. Uh, if, if you look at education, innovation in education looking out is one thing, but for example, one of the largest education systems in the, in the K through 12 in the entire United States is the DOD education system. There have been a lot of lack of, of innovation because they didn't allow innovation, things like that. And that's just one example, healthcare, lots of other things. So we need to really look at how we do, do business. And right now, for example, in the procurement process, and then I'll end, we have a huge number of tabletop acquisitions in critical areas of important innovation. Tabletop acquisition means just get the price there, doesn't matter the quality of the people, doesn't matter the quality of the ideas, and when you have real hard problems, you hire the Navy SEALs. But we're, we're designing our acquisitions across agencies in IT and other places so we can't hire the SEALs for the real innovative problems. So just a, a thought. Tom, you want to address that? I know you, that's an area you, you focus on a lot of how do you get innovation within government itself. Sure, yeah. And I, I think, um, uh, uh, let, let me just give you one example of, of what the administration is trying to do in this area. Uh, I think... Um, Phil appropriately noted that uh, healthcare is an area where we really need to see more innovation. Um, and we, I think we need to see innovation that not only improves quality and access, but also reduce costs, uh, given the fact that healthcare costs are continuing to grow faster than GDP. Um, and so, uh, as part of the healthcare legislation, there is now a Ten billion dollar center for innovation within CMS, uh, the part of the HHS that oversees the Medicare and Medicaid programs, and that uh, that institution is looking at new ways of paying for healthcare that are going to lead to innovation in healthcare delivery that hopefully can Im not only improve uh, uh, health outcomes but also reduce costs. So those. I think there are similar opportunities like that all across the government. So looking at uh, ways in which the government can promote innovation by the way in which it influences markets and the way it buys uh, products and services and, and helps try to achieve uh, uh, national missions, I think, is, is very important. Great. Thank you. Um, so I want to wrap up by uh, just um, a couple things. So one. Uh, um, Ambassador Morantis uh, alluded to the fact that uh, we're going to be doing an event next week, which uh, if you're interested in this area, we're going to drill down a little bit more, if you will. There's a, a trade agreement called the Information Technology Agreement, which was passed under uh, in, in 96 or initiated by the Clinton administration and, and supported by the Bush administration and now again supported by the Obama administration. And uh, so we're having an event next week talking about what are the what are the economic implications for the U.S. in particular in terms of jobs and GDP about uh, expanding that agreement? And uh, really, an all-star panel next week. So I encourage you to, to come if you can. Um, 
uh, Ambassador Miriam Shapiro, who, who is uh, Demetrius' uh, counterpart, uh, Sue Schwab, who is USTR, head of USTR under the Bush administration, and uh, Charlene Barshevsky, who was USTR head under the Clinton administration. <clears throat> so really, really a, a stellar uh, uh, group of speakers next week. So, uh, so this was really a great event. I really appreciate all four of our speakers. I appreciate you, so please join me in thanking them.